Hello everyone, this is Bruce Stephen Holmes, the Timeless Voyager, and I have on the line today from Virginia. Are you in Virginia Beach or? Oh no, not Virginia Beach. Okay, you're out in, you're actually in Virginia. We're in the foothills of the Blue Ridge, that's where we like to say we are. Foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Mm -hmm. Robert A. Monroe. Uh, Robert Monroe has written uh, two books that I'm familiar with at this point, Journeys Out of the Body and Far Journeys. Uh, there's been a biography written about you by Bayard Stockton, is that right? That's right. Okay, mm -hmm. and that's called Catapult. Uh, let me tell uh, my listeners a little bit about you. Uh, you have a degree from Ohio University after studying engineering and journalism. Ohio State University. Ohio State. There's a difference. All right. <laughs> okay. And you then entered the uh, broadcasting industry and in 1939 went to New York where you created and produced over 400 radio and TV network programs. So uh, I feel uh, gratitude that you're even uh, talking to me here on the radio. Well, you shouldn't feel uh, gratitude, just have fun, that's all. All right. Uh, in addition, in addition, uh, you directed and wrote and composed all the orchestral music for the programs, is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow, much of which is still in use in television and motion pictures today. Uh, some of it, mm hmm Okay. You formed the Robert Monroe Productions, which at its peak produced 28 radio network shows weekly. That's right. Later becoming vice president of programs and director of Mutual Broadcasting System until 1956. Uh, became president of Lowry Associates. Is that Lowry or Lowry? Like your pig. All right. Uh, formed Jefferson Cable Corporation, of which you were the president until 1976. Founded the Monroe Institute of Applied Sciences in 1973. Uh, I see your facilities and laboratories are in Afton. Uh, nearby, yes. Nearby Afton, Virginia. Uh, granted a generic patent in 1975 for a method and technique of inducing relaxation and sleep. And you refer to that as the FFR. What does that stand for? That stands for Frequency Following Response. We... Uh Research and determine certain sound patterns, patterns in sound, which means they are non-invasive, as it were. They're not electrical stimulation, is what I'm saying. And these uh, induce various states of consciousness, basically. We call it a frequency following response because you can identify them by taking an EEG, a brainwave study, and see these particular patterns within the brain. Hmm. All right, we're going to get back to that. Uh, you're internationally known for your work with the effects of sound waves on human behavior, which is what this is uh, primarily about. Is that right? That's true. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, you're a pioneer in exploring out-of-the-body experiences, and your book, Journeys Out of the Body, has become the undisputed classic in the field of out-of-the-body out of body experience research. Kind of hard to say that, but I think that's that pretty much sums it up. Anything you want to add to that before we start, Mr. No, Lee? you're doing very well. Great. All right, for my listeners, let's start with this very uh, important question. What is an out-of-the-body experience? Well, let's start and make a, uh, a number that's interesting. Uh, not our studies, but recent studies, and that means within the last 10 years or so, indicated that 25% of the population in the United States remembers having at least one spontaneous out-of-body experience. What is it? Well... It's best described as uh, a state of consciousness, awareness, uh, which means your mind is uh, awake and alert. Uh, that ha does not depend on physical sensory input, meaning it is acting from your perspective separate and apart from your physical body. And uh, as to what and how that is, there's been a lot of scientific discussion as to what that is, and our religions have given it a name, too. But basically, uh, it, you are able to exercise uh, uh, facsimiles, is the best word, of the sensory input that you have in the physical sense, in the physical uh, uh, continuity, as it were. So if you can think of that, that you are perceiving and separate and apart from this physical mechanism that provides you with this input, you're able to see, uh, for example, uh, and you're able to hear, and in some cases able to touch. Now, I've never been able to smell very well or, or taste in the out-of-body state, but that out-of-body consciousness, as it were, is able to be 
well, let's say, two inches away from the physical, or if you want to put it at the extreme, uh, you can go to Mars and cruise around Mars and see what's going on there. It's that, uh, it's that unlimited. All right. Now, uh, there are those who would refer to this as the astral body. Would that be a good term to use here? Uh, well, we don't like it, and the reason we don't like it is because it has sort of a an occult connotation to it in the sense that it was used in a time sort of prior to the scientific model that we attempt to follow. So we like, we and a, sci uh, a psychologist friend uh, way back in, in the early 60s came up with the O-O-B-E, Ubi, and that sounded too bad, so we says settled for O-B, out-of-body experiences. So you like to, to look at this thing uh, in a pragmatic way, I guess, uh, scientifically speaking. Very much. All right, now let's say then pragmatically, what would be the purpose of an out-of-the-body experience then? Well, that's, <laughs> that's the enigma, the uh, question. That took me a lot of work to find out what value it had, if any. And the second thing is that uh, through the years, uh, what purpose, uh, that's, that's open to a lot of discussion. Uh, there have been all sorts of ways that one can use it and one does use it. But I think the key thing is to recognize that uh, we are firmly sure now that everyone goes out of their body during what we call delta sleep or deep sleep, as, they, right. as we call it. So when we see, when we see delta waves... Yes, and that's, um, that's uh, a sleep where you are uh, at very low level of... Uh, physical uh, response, and uh, it's that deep sleep that we all have uh, during our sleep cycle for anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes, and maybe sometimes more. So there are cycles here, the cycles of delta. That's right. We all have cycles of delta. We have cycles of an hour and a half cycle of sleep, uh, and that's uh, a pattern we have all during our whole sleep period. Mm -hmm. But a part of that is the delta sleep state and we sort of drift down to that delta state, and then we get there, and then we become totally inert. And the, uh, blood pressure goes down, temperature goes down, and we respond very little to any external stimuli. We found that in lab studies that a person in the out-of-body state uh, resembles near perfectly the profile of delta sleep. All right, now the difference, of course, is their consciousness. Is that, that right? That's true. Mm -hmm. Now, um, let's come back to Delta for a moment. Um, let's say, scientifically speaking, or let's say objectively, objectively, is there any way to know uh, whether a person is having a conscious out-of-body experience versus an, can you say, unconscious? Oh, by all means. All right, an unconscious oh, oh, out-of-body experience? Is there a way to tell the difference? Oh, yes, indeed. Uh, for example... Uh uh, a person in the out-of-body state, and let's say that uh, uh, by m a peculiar kind of means of establishing a, a still a relationship with the physical body can report in while they're in the out-of-body state. Now, I cannot do that, but we have had any number of people who can. All right, now let me stop for a second. What you're saying is that uh, people that you have worked with, and, and I noticed this in your book because you have... Um, uh, information. Uh, it seems like they're, I guess, uh, recorded um, out-of-body experiences. Is that correct? That's true. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, those experiences from those people are such that they're actually able to respond while they are out of body. And what do we know about that then? They actually report... They report what they're doing and how they're doing. And uh, uh, in, and uh, some very few, and it is few, uh, that you can communicate back to them. In other words, they're using the, their hearing and vocal means uh, to, in turn, stay in contact with you. It's a, it's a learned thing, a thing that you have to learn. And not everyone can do it. I, can, I did not learn how to do it. All right, now this happens, again, we're, we're talking about <laughs> the fact that um, now, if an EEG looks at a person who is is talking to you during this state, does the EEG show delta still? It shows delta superimposed with uh, a a beta signal 
or composite beta signal that indicates a part of the brain uh, is operating to do this communication process. I know that's very interesting. I, I presume that was really interesting. Actually. Yeah, the speech center becomes activated. Okay, so let's let's come back then to to this question then that I started out with. Um, what, what what then is the purpose? Uh, other than let's say exp exploration or pioneering, uh, and, I, and I'm sure now I'm sure Robert that this question was asked when, uh, for example, Columbus went to the New World. People said, "Why would you want to go there?" So I'm sure that this question is being asked now to you. Why would people want to do this type of research? Well, uh, that that's uh, I had to face that question all the way back in uh, would you believe it back in 1958 and 59, which is a long ways back. And it took me, uh, uh, I needed, desperately need to learn how to control it. Because uh, I, I would uh, suddenly move out of my body when I'm, any time I would lie down. And that became very embarrassing and very frightening. And I had to learn how to control it. So um, uh, conventional science had no answer whatsoever for that. And uh, the, uh, my close friend, psychologist and psychiatrist, didn't have the answer either. So we set up an R&D program in my company trying to find out answers for this. And uh, one of the things that happened, it took, for example, a full year of validation and documentation of where I went and what I did and what I perceived in order for me to recognize that it was nothing more than an, halluc than an hallucination. So it's not that easy to transfer it other than to uh, from what might be a dream or a, a, an hallucination into a reality. It just takes, uh, to that left brain of ours, it takes sometimes a great deal of evidence to convince it. All right, are you saying then that, that uh, when the person, let's just use an example, uh, when a person first has an out-of-body experience, uh, they may not be able to logically understand what has happened? That's quite true. And uh, there are some very common... Uh, we rationalize it away because we just don't have culturally any answer for it. Uh, the best way I can describe that is, for example, that we now know that anyone who has a flying dream is symbolizing an out-of-body state. They can't uh, identify it any other way. So they have a flying dream. And some people have to rationalize it but say they were in an airplane. So they're actually experiencing the feeling of free flight, mm -hmm. and then through the dream they interpret it in whatever way they can through their logic. Yes, and virtually all, all cases that we've encountered where a person has a falling dream, and that's re-entering the physical body. And so how many people, if you, you can pick up hundreds of thousands of people who have had a falling dream where they fall and wake up, and that's re-entering the physical so when a person has this uh, falling dream or when the person has a flying dream, what we have then in actuality is an awakening of their consciousness uh, to the fact that there is an out-of-body experience going on. That's right, but, uh, but uh, this, uh, uh, their interpretation of it, because they are totally unaware of it, uh, has to uh, translate it somehow so they do the best they can. All right, so I guess the, the, the first start, the first step here is that a person starts awakening to the flying dream. Is that correct? Uh, not necessarily, no. Well, otherwise, what, what would you say would be the... Uh, I'm talking before they did any research. For example, there might be someone who says to you, I've never had a flying dream. Well, I don't know if anybody would ever say that, but... Well, they could, yes. I can give you one of the most, uh, currently, the most interesting uh, uh, facets of out-of-body activity that has certainly been attracting attention over the last, say, 10 years, and uh, is, I think they have an estimate now of, what is it, something like 25 million people that they know of that have had it, and that's a near-death experience, which is a, a rather extreme version of the out-of-body. And uh, that, uh, the one thing that that certainly does with everyone who has an NDE, as they call it, is get them past the belief stage into the knowing that they survive physical death. And if you, that is a very profound piece of knowledge, that if you get that knowledge, it alters your life considerably. Okay. 
let's let's move along for a second. Let's talk a little bit about locale two. Is that how you say it? That's one way of putting it. Yeah, right. that's the old-fashioned way. All right. What's the new way? Well, uh, we call it a phasing process now. All right. Did I, I do? I need to. Is there some background before we jump into that? Or <laughs> well, uh, uh, it, uh, say what was it? Twenty years ago, I called it locale two. Now we have we've gotten again a better and more scientific explanation for what's taking place. All right. Would you like to hear that? I'd love to. Uh, think of it this way: uh, you, I, at this moment, are very carefully focused in time space. Uh, we have a focusing mechanism that uh, we call a physical body, and it gives us all this heavy physical sensory input that gets us and keeps us uh, phased into time space. In other words, we're here. Our consciousness is here. Our mind is totally here. The moment that you stop uh, focusing in that time space that intently, let's call it inattention, just that much, you have become slightly out of phase with uh, this physical time space. This means that you are in thought, as it were, uh, instead of totally there. And let's say that you're still 90 degrees uh, focused in time space and 10 degrees into something, somewhere, some way else. And then you have the stages called daydreaming, which are a little, little more out of phase. And then you have a controlled out of phase state, say, call it meditation, where let's say that you are 30 to, 30 to 35 percent phased into another reality system or, or getting in touch with it. And there, you're, while you are still, a great part of you is still in phase with time space doesn't take much to follow that phasing relationship outward to where you get into uh, states caused by drugs, alcohol, and things like that, uh, where you are more and more out of phase. Uh, you get into illnesses, and they create a greater degree of out of phase. And inst inst very innocently, uh, we all fall asleep. And then we are, say, 90 degrees out of phase. We're still in touch with time-space. But our consciousness, our, our mind is elsewhere. So that, that's uh, a, a real quick version of what we call phasing. All right, so let's, let's come back to this phase then, uh, which is now, which phase is locale 2? Locale 2 is somewhere beyond, beyond the stage we call sleep. All right, what happens there? Well, uh, this is, uh, uh, as we now perceive it, uh, is a, a mass of phase relationships of which uh, the outer body is uh, one part of a spectrum. If you can think of consciousness as being a spectrum that encompasses uh, time-space here on Earth and moves into other energy systems as it changes in pattern, so that when you are asleep, you are drifting even deeper into what I said, into delta sleep, where you are very much, say, 90% out of phase with time-space. And this means that you have an awareness, a consciousness there. The fact that you don't remember it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Now, what we're talking about when you say locale, too, is that area beyond uh, that is symbolized by us in delta sleep, by us meaning our culture. Uh, let me see. Am I, am I going to uh, guess that 100% is death? 100% is death, yes. Or what we, well, perceive, what what means, we perceive as the death experience here. That's right, and all that is very simply uh, that if you have that wonderful knowledge that you do survive physical death no matter what you do and act and be and think here, uh, you are merely then don't have a focusing mechanism to phase you into time-space. It's all falling apart, so you can't stay here any longer. So then you are there you are there in that area past delta sleep. But you are uh, there, you're conscious, you're, quote, awake, and you have means of perceiving there. And that's what the out-of-body state is, is a temporary visit there, if you want to think of it mm -hmm. that way. This is Bruce Stephen Holmes, The Timeless Voyager, and I'm speaking today with Robert A. Monroe, author of Far Journeys and Journeys Out of the Body, uh, probably the world's authority right now on out-of-body experiences. Um, 
are there esoteric schools in what you used to call locale two or uh, are there other worlds, other beings? What are we looking at then there? Well, uh, uh, what you're looking at, first of all, are, are the multitude of, uh, when you get into this other area, non-physical area of, of being, uh, states of being, the first thing you encounter, of course, is uh, what we call the belief system territories, where one is attracted automatically after they exit here, by this phasing process because it's something familiar to them. And these are, of course, uh, all of the various religions have uh, a belief system that creates uh, a state of being in this non-physical area, this non-physical part of this consciousness continuum. I know it sounds like a bunch of gobbledygook, but it's very simple. <laughs> uh, well, actually it doesn't, but um, the, 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 I think the question I have then is, all right, so first come the belief systems. Yeah. All right. What's next? What's next? Well, if you can get, and there are a lot of people who, more people than you would care to think, that are not, uh, let's call it, entrapped in belief systems. All right. Maybe I could stop for a moment. Uh, let's just hit on this belief system once more. Does that mean that if you are a Christian, you will come across saints and perhaps uh, Jesus the Christ, etc.? All of that, yes. That's all. Right. all that's a, that is a, a one large part of this consciousness spectrum. All right, now so that is, is Buddhism. So is uh, 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 Islam. All sorts of it. All right. So the belief systems that you are carrying in this, let's say, time-space continuum, follow into this first area. Is that correct? Very much so. Yes. All right. Now, and then you're saying to me that there are people who do not have belief systems, let's say, for example, an atheist or a, an existentialist? No, they don't have to be that. They just, right. uh, their intellect grows to a, par, a point where uh, that's not enough. All right. I can ask you a very simple question, Bruce. Uh, uh, would, and, and this, this is where you, get, uh, where you get into the interest or fun part of it. Would you like to spend all eternity lying on a cloud and strumming a harp? Absolutely not. Well, <laughs> and, uh, and matter of fact, that's what annoyed me when I went to Lutheran school as a kid. I kept thinking to myself, I love the idea, but I mean, is there something I can do there? <laughs> well, that, that's, that's, uh, then I get around to the basis of what's so stimulating and exciting about the out-of-body experience and becoming proficient at it is that you realize there are a myriad of other options and most of them make the belief systems look rather silly. <laughs> All right. And those options are so broad and, 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 uh, and so detailed. I can give you option number one, which is a very, very common one, and that's to recycle and have another lifetime here. All right. And uh, that is, all of us do that many, many times because we have become addicted to being human. So we like the uh, focus on time space. Well, we like being human. We like to eat. We like okay. to. Uh, we like the sexual drive. We like uh, uh, the excitement, the fun of it, the, and all the process of being human. We like so much that we got to come back and have more. Or and there's no law that makes you do that. That's the important part. So it, it's you that wants to do this. So people who say you have to come back because of your karma. You can undo your karma in other other places. And you don't need to undo it. You can undo it yourself by a simple twist of your thinking, and that's all. Hmm. And uh, that's so, but you see, that is an option to come back. And people, uh, uh, each of us maybe uh, probably does that several thousand times, to give you an idea. See, human recorded history, as we know it, is very, very small. If you go back... 800,000 years, then you begin to get where uh, humankind has been. Meaning? Meaning that there have been civilizations uh, far surpassing ours that have existed here, and human civilizations, and I should probably say humanoid because they were somewhat different from us. Okay. So the time spectrum that we look at is, is very, very small and incidental. In terms of, Rick, in terms of recorded history. Right. Mm -hmm. So... But you think that that's the one option, to come back and recycle. Okay. And then you get in uh, setting the belief systems aside. Uh, then you've got this 
great span of the whole physical universe, and you can go and live another type of intelligent life in on some other planet, uh, six million light years from here, or something like that. And uh, we know of about five anyway already. But the, mind you, these are not human forms. Okay, uh, that's the interesting thing to realize. You can't leave me. You can't leave me and my listeners with you know of five. <laughs> <laughs> Can well, we? Uh, one of the ones that we've encountered most oddly enough is we call it the alligator system. <laughs> okay. Because the physical body there it resembles very much an alligator. Okay. But it has an intelligence equal or superior to ours, and certainly uh, it isn't uh, uh, tech, uh, technical. Uh, culture such as we are because it doesn't need it mm -hmm. but uh, but they look like alligators they look like alligators and they have a lot more fun than we do because alligators are amphibious and that's right and it's a lot of fun you'd be surprised and you I would be surprised I'd, I'd like very much to, to uh, I'm not going to get into this now <laughs> okay uh, hey, wait, in, in the alligator doesn't mind wallowing around in mud it just feels good don't good. you see we try to keep clean. What is the lifespan uh, for one of these uh, alligator types? Oh, about as near as we can figure it, about 300 years of, of our type of years. Okay. So, and then you go on from that, and there are these other types. And, and one of the most fascinating uh, types is a, a one that's an intelligent bird, and it's a bird culture. And that's nice because they're, they're not only amphibious, but they fly, too. So it's an amphibious bird. That's right, <laughs> like a duck, you know, or something uh -huh. like that. Uh, although it doesn't have the same attributes that we look at as birds, but they're they're nicely planned and nicely organized. They're very well, a very beautiful design, hmm. and they're a lot of fun because you can soar uh, like you like an eagle. If you've ever flown gliders or sailplanes, you can you come very close to saying, "Well, I want to go there." Well, because now we have a real mixture here on Earth uh, of. Uh, different animal types um, are you saying that in a system like this that they would be the they would be considered the intelligentsia of that they're the dominant system? species yes in 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 their worlds these are the dominant species just as we are the dominant species here on earth do they do they have humanoids there or no no mm -mm. they couldn't make it <laughs> so really they're the top of the chain in that particular place that's true mm -hmm. all right so you say, I'm trying to answer that yeah. fundamental question. What would you do with uh, being able to willfully, consciously control and, and move in the out-of-body state? I love it. You can pre-explore all of these things before uh, you do have a physical exit here. So do you have a pretty good idea what you'd like to do next before you are forced to do that, see? All right, so these are the other worlds. What about esoteric schools? Well, in what it were? Uh, again, uh... You mean here on Earth? No, no, outside in the uh, different uh, areas of what you used to call locale too. Uh, they are uh, a lot of those are attached to belief systems. Oh, they are. That's in yes. the belief system area. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they don't go higher and higher. And well, uh, uh, within the limits of that belief system. Okay. Yeah. So and then if that uh, so after you've exhausted the physical universe, which may take an eternity if you want to get. Addicted there. Can you see how easy you get addicted? Oh, yeah. Timeless Voyager Radio will return after these messages. You are listening to Timeless Voyager Radio. I don't know how many times I've been here, but... <laughs> well, just think of these other areas that... I know how many times I wake up each morning. <laughs> <laughs> just think of how many times you would you could go play being an alligator or this super bird. Hmm. It, it, it's, it's very addictive, just like ours is, from a different point of view. So is there... A, all right, so now are we talking then that there is a, a level beyond this addictive part? Well, that, the point is that they these various other intelligent species... Uh, uh, mature, and I guess that's the word, just as we eventually mature, and we immigrate. And the reason we immigrate is, is because we've had all we can get out of this, and very frankly, you know what the real reason for immigration is? No. We become bored. Okay. All right? 
and uh, you can say, how could you possibly become bored? Uh, because you realize that you could become involved here forever in, in finding out each electron and each biological pattern, everything else, and it goes on endlessly. So if you get a good sampling of it and you find almost that, well, this is where I came in. Well, it's, it's, it's a repeating cycle. Right. Anyway, that gives you an idea of that. And then, of course, uh, the thing you're probably waiting to hear is what do you do in a non-physical sense? Yeah, let's do that. And uh, then, then, or that's the vista that truly opens up because... One of the things that you become aware of, that a graduate of this compressed learning human school uh, it becomes uh, the equivalent of a god in these other energy systems. Uh, because of things that we learn so naturally, we think are, uh, well, they're just everyday stuff, is exquisitely, exquisitely valuable in these other systems. And as such, I, I can only tell you it is... Uh, it is, the, the temptation gets very great not to be a god, but to do things in these other energy systems. For example, I reach and I, very without thinking, pick up a cup of coffee and, and sip the coffee and put it down again. That is a manipulation of energy, mechanical energy, but there are other, uh, there's electrical energy and chemical energy all connected with it. The ease with which we learn to do these kinds of things can be applied in other kinds of energy. Can you see? Oh, definitely. Yeah. And the other system that we learn so so vividly, we learn measurement. Uh, uh, that it's so hard to understand that, well, everybody learns measurement. So we have, we're a polarized uh, 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 environment. We have uh, good and bad or constructive or destructive, whatever labels you want to put. So we learn measurement. And that polarity measurement system, again, is very, very valuable in evaluation. But what we really have most of all that we take with us, and you do take it with you, is the thing we came to get. And that is, uh, if we use the symbol left brain, that's what it is. Okay. Or intelligence, uh, the ability to analyze, calculate. All of that is, what's, is what you came to get and you take it with you. And, oh, that's the stuff that is pure, pure, uh, invaluable elsewhere in these other energy systems. All right, let's does, that, does that lead it up enough? Oh, yeah, I think, I think we're <laughs> really, and I, I'm sure everybody's got lots of questions about these things, but, but what I'd like to do is I'd like to um, move on to a couple other things, too. By all means. First of all, uh, the uh, FFR and how that's tied into Hemisync, I think those two things are tied together, is that correct? Uh, they are, yes. Mm -hmm. And perhaps uh, you might explain those. Uh, I'm sure my listeners, and, and certainly I would like to hear a better explanation than I understand at this point. Well, uh, bear in mind, first of all, that uh, uh, that in, say, in, in the late 50s, we were, and we still are, we think, uh, sometimes we wonder, uh, we were and are professional sound people. Uh, in other words, sound was our business. And we had been in business for some time in the production of sound in various ways. So we turned to sound quite naturally in order to do these things. And, and first of all, in order to find out how we could uh, begin to control the out-of-body experience, we began to use sound, sound to affect consciousness. And we soon learned that we could, by using, I might add, uh, uh, known brainwave frequencies and converting converting them into what uh, sound amplitudes, now, not frequency, but sound amplitudes, we were able to, say, uh, induce sleep very easily and to uh, stay awake very easily. And that was the beginning. Now, those are ga categories of consciousness. Uh, if you think of uh, a sound being loud and soft, loud and soft, that's difference in amplitude. And we use that running frequency of amplitude to create a resonance by listening to it uh, where the brain waves that of any individual listening to that uh, would indeed begin to have a frequency following response. The frequency of that amplitude would be reflected in the brain wave. So if you wanted a person to go to sleep, you would feed a particular system of theta and delta waves and they would get sleepy. So what we did then in terms of, of work with that, we were working with amplitude. 
And then as we went on, we found a better way to do it because these brainwave frequencies that are uh, common in the human brain are of a frequency that are, is, is lower than human hearing. Uh, let's use an illustration that here's an 8 hertz signal, which means 8 cycles per second, that we cannot hear. So how to get it into the human brain other than using an amplitude method? We found then the, the binaural beat would work it, uh, very beautifully in that respect. Now, uh, we did not invent the binaural beat by any matter of means, but in essence it works this way. If we put uh, a 100 hertz audio signal, which you can hear, hear, and put it in one ear, and put a 108 signal hertz signal in the other ear, the differential between those two would be an 8 hertz signal. Now, what happens in that case is that that beat frequency is 8 hertz, the difference between the two. When we use that and had a person listen to it, the brain would synthesize that 8 hertz frequency. They wouldn't, the brain wouldn't hear it, incidentally, but the electrical signals, in essence, in the brain would synthesize that 8 hertz differential. That's binaural beat, and that's what we call hemisync. Okay, now what did that 8 uh, do as far as consciousness was concerned? Well, uh, that uh, I used that one arbitrarily because uh, that is uh, a slight variation of it is what is part of the Schumann resonance. Uh, that is the one that we as humans grew up with uh, through millions of years, and uh, it, uh, it will create a form of physical relaxation. Mm -hmm. Okay, now this is the frequency following response. Now, this is a frequency following response in actual frequency instead of amplitude. That's what the binaural beat helps us do. All right. Because then we are putting into the brain by sound the actual, the actual uh, 8 hertz signal as against having it simply be an amplitude pattern uh, that is only in one signal. Okay, now even though this stuff is a little complicated, but still it's good to go over it. Uh, now, is hemisync then... Uh, the use of this in uh, ways to create different levels of consciousness? That's true, very much so. And what we do is that we use, uh, we use this differential process of binaural beats uh, as being about 50% more efficient than simply the amplitude system. Now, you are able to create then, uh, for example, a meditative state. Oh, yes, that's, that's real easy. Now, what, uh, what was your comparison there? What did you use to, to decide that this was a med meditative state? And that it was or was not? Was. Well, it depends on what type of meditative. We found that there's, there are different kinds of meditative states. For example, there was years back, there was a great to-do about having a, uh, alpha, getting into the alpha state. Okay. Were, were you around during that time? Mm -hmm. Yes. And it was, oh, let's, let's get ourselves into alpha. Alpha is just a state of uh, 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 conscious relaxation, and that's uh, we have not found it interesting enough to play with. What about theta? Theta is a is a state where uh, it is a, a lot of uh, creativity occurs in theta, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, it's great for uh, ideas, word pictures, and things like that. Uh, it it's um, uh, the crossover state between uh, this type of consciousness and the consciousness of Delta Sleep. Mm -hmm. And because of that, you are partially freed of the restrictions uh, that are um, upon you during this normal wakefulness here. And as a result, you are freed, your mind is freed to perceive in ways that it has not perceived before, and that's, what, that's where a lot of meditation takes place. Um, what about uh, a meditative technique like uh, transcendental meditation? Uh, that's a, uh, I'm not, I don't at all pretend to be totally aware of exactly what they're doing now, but uh, they have uh, developed a pattern of establishing such a state by uh, forms of which I'm not at all tightly familiar, but uh, some type of repetitive practice, uh, whether it be what they call a mantra or something like that, 
evidently does produce a, a state down in theta. I'm not sure how they do it. Hmm. Um, now, uh, let's move from the meditative state. You uh, have focus 10, you call it. What is, is focus 10? 10 is a very, uh, uh, a very specific uh, state that might be called a meditative state. But it, we make it much simpler than that and keep it very broad ranged. Uh, we take a simple definition and say the mind is awake, body is asleep. The body is just detuned, actually, so that these uh, these heavy physical sensory input uh, patterns are not uh, interfering with your ability to think. And that's a, make a, people make a quite a great discovery in ten in the sense that. They discover they do not need all of that uh, five physical sensory patterns in order to be uh, awake, alert, and and uh, full of uh, mind consciousness, as it were. All right. Now, what about twelve and fifteen? These are pretty spectacular, as far as I was concerned. Well, they do get fun as they go along. Uh, twelve is uh, a thing that we've discovered, and through the years, and we've been, incidentally, we we're in about the who. 15th year of our gateway program that works with this these particular uh, consciousness states. Yeah, I'd like to talk about that gateway program yeah. after this. This will be good. So anyway, uh, 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 12 is a state where once having detuned these uh, other physical inputs, we find that you can begin to perceive in other ways. Uh, we call it uh, a state of expanded awareness. But what has happened is that these other means of perception have been covered over or overwhelmed by all the physical input and the moment those get detuned and you still have retain your consciousness you begin to perceive in these other ways and 15 yeah, and 15 is a is an interim nice state uh, which we call the state of no time and uh, it is fun because people have great expectations of what state of no time is not no space, but no time. And uh, the interesting part about it, of course, is that nothing is there. <laughs> it, the People get into uh, 15 and have all these things they expect of it, when it's really, it is. A, it has to be a self-instigating place, state. Yeah, and nothing will happen unless you make it happen. You can lie around in no time forever unless you take thought steps in order to, uh, move in any given direction. This is Bruce Stephen Holmes, The Timeless Voyager, and I'm back here with Robert A. Monroe, um, author of Far Journeys and Journeys Out of the Body. Uh, when we left, we were about to talk about the Gateway Program. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what it is and perhaps how it started? Well, it's kind of interesting in that uh, you have the Voyager Program, and our prime Gateway Program is called The Voyage. <laughs> So maybe you are a voyager and don't know it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. A uh, gateway began uh, years ago, and years ago means about 1973, I guess, uh, when we had uh, we were not particularly, in any broad sense, uh, disseminating the results of our research back at that time, but uh, we had developed these techniques and. Uh, one day, one representative uh, of Esalen, if you know where Esalen is? Yeah, Northern California. That's right. It's at... Um, near near Big Sur. Yeah, near Big Sur. Uh, called and asked why one, one of our uh, psychologist friends probably instigated, why don't, we, why don't we do a workshop at Esalen based upon the methods we had developed? And... We thought, oh, that's fine. That'll give us a brand new bunch of subjects to test. So what we did, uh, we gathered a couple of our engineers together, and off we went out to, to Big Sur and Esalen and conducted this program over a weekend. And um, it was most fascinating because we had uh, an idea of how to do it, and the idea was not necessarily the way to do it. We thought we were based it on sleep cycles, and we let a subject go through some training programs and uh, for an hour and a half and then sleep an hour and a half. And that worked beautifully because in one of the hour and a half, they'd obviously eat. But uh, we are, uh, the poor trainers of it, didn't have any chance to sleep at all. 
So I have a wonderful picture of Bill Yost, uh, this electronics engineer who was helping conduct this, if you can imagine it, falling out of his chair in sleep after about eight or nine hours of it. So, so the trainers had to get on this schedule, too, otherwise. The, the, gator, the trainers didn't learn how to sleep that hour and a half along with everybody else. So anyway, that attracted attention, and then we did one at, at uh, Esalen in San Francisco. At, uh, we were smarter that time. <laughs> and uh, they thought, well, that was interesting, it worked a great deal, and we had, at that time, there were physicists there, and, and doctors and everything else were attending it, and... We got all this response. So what do we do? Well, we thought, oh, this is a fine means to really have a broadbanded research program where we'll have a lot of subjects. So we uh, accepted uh, the invitation to uh, start doing these in various parts of the country. And we uh, thought, well, we have to have a name for it. So we called it the M5000, thinking if we had the magic number of 5,000 people attending it, we would have a baseline of information that would be fantastic. Well, uh, after about two or three or four years of this, we decided that uh, we would never reach that 5,000 number, so we would give it some other name. So we gave it the name of the Gateway Program. And uh, uh, so we began moving this up into the in various uh, conference centers of out west, we did it at a place called Westerbeck Ranch, if you know where that is. Anyway, uh, we did it in various parts of the country and, and, and overseas in Hawaii and in England and places like that. And finally, uh, we got to the point where we felt a better need to do it in a uh, more productive form, so we built a facility here in Virginia, specifically... Uh, to handle this gateway program, and it, it has worked ma uh, magnificently. We've been here for over 10 years. Uh, what we've done, we have each uh, participant in a gateway program. He comes here for a week, and what he does is he, in essence, has what we call a check unit, which is an acronym for Controlled Holistic Environmental Chamber. And he spends a good part of his time in that, in other words, in working in uh, taped exercises, and he even sleeps in it at night because it's a controlled sleep environment. So uh, that has evolved through the years into what it is today, which is, I would say, 40% of, at least 40% of the participants in the program are professionals. By that means uh, 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 psychologists, psychiatrists, MDs, researchers, Oh, and we have our good share of physicists because it's a thing that appeals to them very much. And uh, we move on past 15 into other states of, of consciousness up to what we call 21, and why we stop there, who can ever know. And uh, at 21, you are right on the edge of being able to probe all these other reality systems uh, that uh, include certainly the out-of-body and include uh, uh, well, the post-mortem area, as it were, it's a great freedom there at 21, but you have lost all fear of these unknown areas, and that's the key. Now, you need to lose fear to get into 21, is that correct? You need to get, yes, and this is a basically a very careful fear-reducing process so that you're not afraid of these unknown states. And the way we do it is that uh, we prove very succinctly to the individual that he's, been, he's only learning to control what he's been doing all the time. And it's the control factor that counts. So that uh, uh, when he wants to uh, go to 10, he can do it. Doesn't need the tape, as a matter of fact, after that. Or doesn't need to go to sleep. He doesn't need a tape to go to sleep. He doesn't need a tape to go and explore all these because he has no fear of it anymore. He now has not this, the fear of the unknown. Is this where we come across the dreamers, the locked in, the wild ones? <clears throat> oh, yes. This is where all these... Uh, what are the dreamers? <clears throat> hmm? What are the dreamers? Uh... These are people that are uh, basically locked into belief systems that they can't get out of, whatever it may be. And that's a, that's a polite way of saying it. <laughs> All right, the locked-ins are part of that then. Yeah, that's right. The wild ones. Well, that, they, these are people who uh, have basically uh, 
uh, died and found that, oh, I'm free and I can do all the things that I was prevented from doing when I was in a physical body. But they forget that they don't have a physical body to do it. <laughs> so what do they do? Well, they uh, just keep trying. Hmm. How about the others? Which others? I don't know. I thought I, re I thought I was. <laughs> well, there's quite a few others, but <laughs> like the last timers in the scene. Yeah. Right well, those are those are all part of a long story, Bruce. And Lord knows we could go on for two hours if we get into that kind of run. <laughs> all right. Uh, let me back up for one second. Uh, we were talking about the Gateway Program. What does the Gateway Program do for the individual? What are some of the things that you can do? Well, first and foremost, he, uh, he uh, does learn. Not, we don't teach him. He learns it through just being exposed to the process. Uh, because, first of all, we are totally non-sectarian, have no religious base or no political base either. So uh, there's a, we call it uh, the gateway to freedom in a way. But what the key freedom is, is freedom for, from the fear of the unknown. And that principal unknown being what is beyond this physical existence. And he, well, the moment a person learns that and it alters his, his life here so spectacularly, because all this, uh, if you look around you, you find so much uh, of what you do is based upon fear. And most of it is fear of non-survival, one way or another. So if you can think of that as being a, a key thing, and you also learn to, uh, to accept and explore one's own self, and that self-exploration takes place, again, uh, on the part of the individual, because once he is free of that fear, then... He is free to explore his self first. Never mind all this other spectacular areas. He learns to free himself of all of the restraints that he had self-induced within him. He doesn't become a, a violent person. He becomes a free person. There's a great difference. All right. Um, if you have a couple minutes, uh, your comments and a few ideas. Prayer. Prayer? Uh, the interesting thing about prayer is somewhere along the way, uh, what, uh, 2,000, 5,000 years ago, whatever, uh, someone learned a system uh, where that would induce a, a communication or contact into these other energy systems. And, uh, in other words, ask for help is another way to put it. And used methods and techniques that uh, indeed did do that. But as this was handed down, uh, uh, step by step through generation after generation what worked 5,000 years ago someone along the way says well why should I clap my hands I don't need to clap my hands so I'll just say the prayer or someone says down here well I don't need to close my eyes I'll keep my eyes open uh, a whole series of things uh, of uh, patterns that would induce the result from the prayer have uh, have been uh, deteriorated, uh, distorted, and uh, forgotten through all these years. Is so, there, okay, is, there's obviously a right way then to pray. That's correct, yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Can we know it, or is it too long? <laughs> yeah. How about a synopsis? <laughs> well, go to Focus 12. <laughs> all right, Focus 12. Yeah. Uh, angels and arch archangels, archetypes. Yeah. Um, uh, from the perspective of of where we are now. No, uh, first-hand perspective, from your perspective. Yeah, uh, from my perspective now, uh, there is a, a system of, uh, let's call it helpers, uh, that uh, is a part of each individual. And those helpers uh, are in continual service of that individual and are aimed specifically at that individual. But the interesting part is, is who they are. Would you like to know? Of course. Definitely. They are they are parts of you, and they are parts of you who have lived previous lives. So the uh, guides, for example, are existences that we have had, and we are now, let's say, com compartmentalized right now with a focus. One part of us is focused. That's right. In time, space, and the other parts of us are not focused. That's right. But And so you need a little help to uh, fix a sore toe. Well, uh, one of your 
in one of your your life personalities uh, 20,000 years ago knows all, how, all about fixing sore toes. How do we get in touch with them? What focus? Well, that comes out of 21. That's focus 21. Mm -hmm. um, intelligent animals. Intelligent animals. Well, let me tell you that uh, I can give you an illustration of that. Uh, animals have um, are working in this other energy system automatically, well, just as we do. But uh, I can give you an illustration of how they use it. It's very crude but very workable. We have a few cats uh, where we live, and they roam around in the woods outside. Now, here is a closed, uh, two double closed door system into our kitchen. And we thought, well, uh, when my wife opens the cat food on the uh, can opener, they hear it, and that's what makes them come running. But they're hearing it through a double door. So we say, oh, well, they're, they're, they're smelling the aroma of the cat food once it's open. And how could they do this through all these closed doors? So we tried a little nice, neat device. My wife, all she had to do was think of the process of opening the can and feeding the animals, and they came rushing from 100 yards away. Interesting? Very good. I like that. And, and uh, we, can, we have demonstrated that a, uh, many, many times, just to give you an illustration of uh, animals using patterns that we uh, use and don't know that we're using them. The cat knows. <laughs> okay, here's uh, one of the big ones. Uh, sexuality. Well, I can give you a fast answer for that. Would you like it? I sure would. Let's try a short one. <laughs> <laughs> no, nobody wants a short answer. I know, I know. So, well, think of it here. This, uh, as, as When you uh, took up residence here, you were given, uh, because of what I call this earth life system, uh, it is a survival system that you have to survive, not for first and foremost, you survive yourself so that you can uh, indeed uh, help the species survive. So when you were, quote, born, you're not necessarily in your DNA, but uh, at the animal sub-self level, as I like to call it, you got this imprint that said survive. So uh, if you talk about what that means, it means certain things. It means uh, keep warm, get food, and reproduce. And that's what it is. <laughs> and so uh, a very vital part of that, that reproduction drive, we call sex. And uh, it's a, a very, very uh, heavily motivating force in our lives. And, of course, all of our, our biggest problem is that we are uh, moving into such a system where this survival system, uh, we dominated all the other species in our survival mode so we became uh being the, as much as the whole thing is a predator system we uh as predators didn't have anybody else left to do we've got all the animals taken care of so we became predators on an intraspecies base and that's where we are right now look around you you can see it <laughs> okay uh just a couple more things and i'll let you go and i really appreciate the fact that you've taken this time mr monroe mind food <laughs> Hmm? Mind food. Yes. Why don't you tell us a little bit about mind food? Well, that, uh, anything that lets you begin to uh, fully exercise uh, this really, uh, uh, it truly is unlimited, but we only know how to use our mind in a limited way. And uh, theoretically, education is a form of mind food. Uh, there are other ways of, of learning things and how to apply the mind that we simply don't bother with in our in our culture. Well, Robert, I appreciate you taking the time to be on the show. Do you have anything you'd like to uh, conclude with to my uh, listeners? Anything? No, I, uh, uh, the only main conclusion that you can come is that uh, we look at this mass uh, roiling world in which we live, and if you begin to recognize that there is a very profound purpose in all of